And one of these techniques is exactly the one that helped us go from 9,000 images to one image, which is the one we published. This technique is called clustering and is essentially a way to organize the images in such a way that you can put them into different categories. And then out of these categories, you can look at the statistics. Welcome, welcome to Pelonia Podcast, a podcast about the use of scientific discoveries of technology applications. We provide the best information on projects participated by Pelonia and many more. My name is Gabriela Bernardi, I'm a science journalist, and in today's episode we talk about the black hole in the Milky Way and the event Horizon Telescope with Luciano Rezzola, professor of theoretical relativistic astrophysics at the Institute for Theoretical Physics of the Goethe University of Frankfurt. It's a pleasure to meet you again and uh, would you please briefly introduce yourself to those who don't know you already. Very well, uh, thank you for um, having me. My name is Luciano Rezzola. I am um, a theorist, a, a theoretical astrophysicist, and in particular, I am interested in studying uh, objects with very high curvature. And these are, for instance, black holes or neutron stars. And I also have, ex um, I'm, I'm, I have developed tools, numerical tools, to simulate the dynamics of these objects. Recently, the Event Horizon Telescope project succeeded in obtaining the first image of the supermassive black hole in our galaxy. What is your role in this project? Well, um, the Event Horizon Telescope is a large collaboration um, that requires many different processes, um, almost in a sequence. First. The data needs to be collected through radio astronomical observations. Then the data needs to be analyzed and translated into images. And then once an image is obtained, there is a more theoretical work, which has to do with trying to interpret the image, use it to understand why it looks like it does, and also exploiting it to provide some measurements either in the mass or the spin of the black hole, and whether uh, checking whether there are alternatives to black holes that can be either compatible or incompatible with the observations. My role in particular is that of a theorist. So I perform with, together with my group here in Frankfurt, numerical simulations of plasma accreting onto the black hole and then obtaining images. So in other words, what we do we can be uh, simplified in saying we try to understand what happens if you take a bucket of matter and you throw it onto a black hole, a supermassive black hole, and um, this matter will behave in a very specific manner, uh, following the equations of magnetohydrodynamics. And then we will know, we know through these simulations, what are, for instance, the temperature, the densities near the event horizon of the black hole. But this is not sufficient to get an image. You have to, out of these quantities, you have to uh, produce light. And this light has to be computed properly and, and, and followed in its rather bizarre trajectories that it assumes near a black hole. And only when all of this is done, do we have a, an image. And of course, this is a theoretical image. It's a, what we call a synthetic image. And uh, it's one image that um, is compatible with, with all the laws of physics and mathematics, but it's not necessarily the reality because it is obtained through certain theoretical assumptions. And because we don't know very much about uh, the black hole, we need to do a lot of different simulations to explore all the possible uh, scenarios. And as a matter of fact, in the case of Sagittarius A star, we have performed, uh, we have obtained about 1.6 million synthetic images. Wow, uh, it is true that this image was much more difficult to obtain than the, of the supermassive black hole in M87 and why? 
Well, it definitely was more difficult. <laughs> it took us three years to go through an exercise, which essentially we thought we knew how to play. And the difficulty um, is that Sunday Thursday Star comes with a number of problems. The first one is scattering. Um, when we look in, in the galactic center, we look through the galactic plane and at the center of our galaxy. And as you can imagine, because we are going in, in, in a very dense region of our galaxy, we have a lot of effects that have to do with interaction between light and the matter that we encounter. So this is translated in what we call scattering. And so the image that we obtain of the source is not a pure and, and clean image, but is actually rather diffused. That's the first problem. A second <clears throat> problem and a more serious one is that the mass of Sagittarius A star is about a thousand times smaller of that of M87. In particular, it's about four million solar masses. Every time there is a mass in general relativity, there is a time scale associated with it. And you can think this is, for instance, a time scale necessary to go around the black hole on a given orbit. And the bigger the black hole, the longer this time, the smaller the black hole, the shorter this time. In the case of Sagittarius A star, this time is a few minutes only. This means that we need to take observations of a time scale of eight hours of something, a subject that is moving or changing on a time scale of a few minutes only. As a result, um, our data suffers from many more uncertainties. And this is why we don't have a single image of Sagittarius A star, but we actually have 9,000 images, all of which are compatible with the data. Very impressive. And the project involves about 300 people around the world. Why so many of them? Well, uh, this is in partly, partly because of, of the many different expertise that are needed. You need someone that knows how to operate a radio telescope and you know, uh, up to someone who knows how to operate supercomputers. You need people who are experts with the observations and people who are experts with the, with the theory. And in the case of Sagittarius A star, this is particularly important because some of the problems we have encountered were never encountered before and needed new solutions, new techniques that needed to be developed. And one of these techniques is exactly the one that helped us go from 9,000 images to one image, which is the one we published. This technique is called clustering and is essentially a way to organize the images in such a way that you can put them into different categories. And then out of these categories, you can look at the statistics. I know that this sounds a bit hard to understand. So I normally, provide an analogy, a logical analogy, um, in terms of a time-lapse movie. And in particular, a time-lapse movie of a very famous set of mountains on, in the Italian Dolomites, the, uh, the, what they call it, Tre Cime di Lavaredo. The, um, these are three peaks which are very peculiar. And in a time-lapse movie that you uh, can see on, on the web, you will see that in a typical time-lapse movie, which spans a whole day of observations, the three, the three peaks will not always be visible. Sometimes there's going to be clouds between us and, uh, and the peaks, which will prevent us from seeing the peaks. And sometimes we will see all of them. Sometimes we will see two. Sometimes we will see only one. And sometimes we don't see them at all. So what you can think of is that if you collect all the images in the time-lapse movie, you have a large set of images, which you can organize into boxes. In one box, you put all the images where you see all of the peaks. In another box, you put the image where you see two, one, and none. And then you look at the statistics. And then you convince yourself that if for most of the time, you actually see three peaks, then that is reasonable to assume that during the time you were looking, the three peaks were there and they haven't moved. Of course, we would never think that you know, the peaks just disappear because we don't see them anymore. But in the case of Sagittarius A star, there are some images which do not resemble a ring. 
So we've done something very similar also for Sagittarius the star. We have lots of images, 9,000. We classify them into clusters, and then we look at the statistics. And what comes out of the statistics is that most of the time, 98% of the time, we do see an image that looks like a ring as we published. And in only 2% of the cases, we do not see that. On the basis of this, we are confident that although our images are, are degenerate, there are many of them, the large majority shows a, a ring, and so there is a ring there. Very, very interesting. And uh, what is the actual workflow that you bring from the observations to the final image? Well, uh, you know, it's not a, a it's like in, in a factory that, that <laughs> things happen in, in, in a sequence. Most of the time, you know, um, the, the process um, follows up and down, back and forth. Um, but let's say in a broad brush picture, you can think the first thing you want to do is get the data. So you have to organize, well, even before that, you have to ask time in the different radio telescopes so that you can obtain the time and make the observations. And normally you have to do this one year in advance. Um, after you have obtained the time, the normally this is in the spring, you go and collect the data. So people go to, the, especially the observers, go to the different telescopes in Europe, in Asia, in the US, and even in the South Pole to collect the data. Once the data is collected, the data is put together through uh, this technique, which is called BLBI, or very long baseline interferometry. And once the data is there and, and, and combined and cleaned and calibrated, then there is a team of people that transforms this data into an image. This is a, a rather complicated process for which you need a lot of experience. I don't have that experience, but the uh, collaborators of mine in ESD have this experience. And then they provide um, with an image. And that's when I start really my work. Once I have an image, well, really I've started much earlier because I was, I needed to produce a large number of simulations, but it's when I have an image, an observational image, that I can start comparing all of my theoretical images with the observed one in the process of finding what are the properties of this object and whether the image we obtain corresponds to what we would expect from general relativity. And now is the EHT project planning to process a similar image for other black holes? No, no, really. And, and, and the explanation is, is rather simple. Um, the EHT has a, a given resolution, the ability to see a certain detail on the sky. And what you can do, therefore, is measure black holes that in the sky have a projected dimension that is you know larger than the resolution that we have so that we can actually see them and if you look at all the possible black holes you realize there are just two that are visible with our resolution one is m87 and the other one is sagittarius a star m87 is much bigger but it's also further away sagittarius a star is smaller but it's closer to us so that if you look at them in the sky, and in fact, there's a very nice image that allows you to see both of them uh, side by side, you find out that they are roughly of the same size. And that's why we can see an image. There are other black holes, of course, in the universe, but these are either too small or too far away. And the next two candidates are about a factor two smaller. So we need some more time to improve our techniques before we can actually image them. Okay, and can you explain to the less speculative inclined people why it is kind of a research matters? Well, you know, if you are um, a cynical person, then you would say that this research doesn't matter. But then you would be also rather ignorant because you would ignore that all of the technology that we are using nowadays comes from people addressing very basic questions like the one we are addressing now. So the reason why this research matters is for two reasons. The first one, it advances our knowledge, our knowledge of how the universe works, about whether or not these objects really exist, 
and therefore it addresses very important questions in theoretical physics and astrophysics. But also it matters because we are developing a lot of techniques and experience that is going to find applications in technology, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but all of the science that is, all of the technology that we use nowadays is built behind science as this one here. And uh, now we are at the end of this podcast, but last but not least, if you could go back or forward in time, what would you like to know or discover or meet? Well, you know, if I could go um, forward in time, I would like to uh, maybe in a hundred years time be in the position of having much better quality observations of these supermassive black holes and therefore address some of the questions that right now we cannot address. We know that what we observe is compatible, perfectly in, in perfect agreement with the um, predictions of Einstein's general relativity. However, there are other theories which are equally compatible. These theories are called alternative theories of gravity. They are introduced because one hopes that with this theory, we can have a better uh, understanding of gravity. But this theory is it's not clear yet for a person like me who is a theorist uh, of gravity, which of these theories is really the best one. Of course, general relativity has many advantages over anything else we know, and that is that it's the simplest, most natural theory. So in order to make sure that Einstein's was really right, I need and we need to understand and make sure that the others are wrong. And so I hope that in a hundred years time, um, the observations will allow us to remove some of these doubts, whether or not, for instance, the, the object we're seeing is really a black hole as in predicted by general relativity, a curved solution, or whether maybe we have another black hole with funny or strange properties like a Dilaton action black hole. Thank you so much, Professor Rezzola, for joining us today at this podcast, and thanks to our listeners. If you have any questions about today's show, you can get in touch on Kelonia Twitter, and feel free to subscribe to Kelonia.sbis website and be part of the community. In the meantime, stay tuned for our next interview. Thank you again. Thank you very much, and maybe as a concluding remark, for those who are interested in these topics about gravity, black holes, neutron stars, which are also fascinating objects. There is soon going to be, by the end of the year, a English version of a public outreach book that I have written on this topic. The title says it all. It's the irresistible attraction of gravity, and it's why, and tells you why we are attracted by gravity, not just because it is an attractive force, but actually because it has a grip on our imagination. Fantastic title. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you.